I call myself an artist potter. I'm an artist and a potter. In, in some ways, I, I'm probably a traditionalist. I've always been a potter. Uh, and I like the idea that a potter is, you know, sort of makes cultural objects. Where mm -hmm. I have a bit of a problem with ceramics. Well, you know, ceramics is a material. And uh, so you start to sort of feed into the whole kind of materialistic attitude mm -hmm. that you're defined mm -hmm. by the material you use. And mm -hmm. I want to say, hey, no, I'm much more defined by the, the artifacts I make, and they are mm -hmm. pots. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've got a whole history about them uh, from different cultures, you see. So it's a cultural history I can talk about. Uh, Jonathan, uh, so let's begin. Uh, actually, the, uh, you live in Suffolk, right? So I, I live in Suffolk. It's about, oh, 150 kilometers north of London, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. just in the countryside. You know, it's really nice. Near the coast, so, you know, uh, the English Channel. I'm about mm -hmm. opposite Amsterdam, if you look on the map. Mm. Yeah. Yes. It's just rural countryside, um, but really nice. Yeah. And uh, you don't feel you need to be like in the middle of the scene in London? Oh, I do. I do need to be there. <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting we talk about yeah. these ceramics. Yeah, uh, that's often right. People then tend to, you know, sort of concentrate on the machines, the 3D printers. And I always want to say, oh, it's a much bigger thing that's going on here. It's, it's all mm -hmm. the ability now to draw with code, to draw with 3D modeling programs. But then also... Jonathan, can you tell us about your work? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I've, I've got a series of slides here that I can quickly go through. Uh, so, you know, these pieces here, if um, I just click on the screen, hopefully... And there we move forward. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I started with these iceberg pieces because, you know, I've been, been doing them for some time now. And obviously the, the iconog iconography is about our relationship to the environment, you know, sort of this idea of icebergs and melting icebergs being sort of a, a measure of what we're doing to our environment. So, you know, that, that's my subject area. But then within that, you know, these are generated in code and then 3D printed in porcelain. So my choice of material is really important. So I don't just stick yeah. to one material. I tend to change my materials with whatever project I'm working with. And here the porcelain, um, you know, is like a stone, but at the same time, it's got the translucency of ice. So, mm -hmm. you know, that conversation, that visual conversation of the material is reinforcing the content of the work. Then also... You know, the way the 3D printer works, it, it lays it down, you know, in these layers, like ice is also laid down in layers. You see, mm -hmm. so I think the process also speaks there that I think is really nice. Uh, and then I'm using something like that's called Perlin noise, and that's the uh, algorithm that is uh, used to draw these pieces. Um, and, uh, you know, my interest there is probably in arts and sciences and how scientists are understanding the natural world so much more through running programs, running computer code, uh, and simulating natural processes. And here, this very simple algorithm of the Perlin noise, you start to sort of get the result of the way earth erodes or how ice melts down. And I think that's really interesting. So, you know, within my work, very often, it is very sculptural. They are vessels, because I'm talking about the, you know, sort of the metaphor of the vessel. We are our vessels, our thinking is vessel based, the environment we live in could be seen as a vessel, you know, so the pot is a really nice metaphor here, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and then the choice of material, the process, all builds into the content of the work. Yeah. So then carrying on a bit, uh, this is to help with a bit of background, as I say, I was uh, you know, born, grew up in South Africa. My father uh, was working for uh, animal preservation uh, and this rhinoceros is not dead, it's been immobilized, ready for translocation. So he was working on a project that was Save the White Rhino, you know, and this was oh, in the 60s or so, you know, so unfortunately we are still now still trying to save the, the white and black rhinoceros. But, you know, this experience really worked into, so this is kind of an evolutionary tree. My mm -hmm. mindset, my worldview is one of kind of evolution and ecology. So that's where I'm kind of coming from within my thinking and is what my work is about. And so this piece in the middle, you know, the drawing in the middle is the idea of the sort of um, uh, the biology of beauty that ultimately if we've evolved out of this system, 
then our psychology would have also evolved out of it. So our aesthetic appreciation is absolutely linked with the natural phenomena. And so it's not surprising that, you know, sort of curves and, and all those natural structures that there are, um, we kind of respond to them. We, we get a gut feeling, you know, it's about the, that aesthetic feeling. Um, and uh, so then just uh, further influences, I've already sort of alluded to the arts and sciences. I really think scientists and artists are doing the same thing. We try to understand our existence, you know, sort of human mm -hmm. existence. Mm -hmm. Science, scientists do it in an objective way, whereas art, artists do it in a much more poetic way, you know, but it's still an understanding of kind of what, it, you know, what's life all about, you know. So I guess my work is little objects of philosophy that sounds grand you know we tend to particularly in European philosophy it all, it all gets written down but I think it's uh, kind of intriguing that a lot of Asian philosophy is not written down necessarily it's passed on linguistically uh, through, sorry just through the through um, the voice but also is carried in objects you know um, in say stones, in trees, and you know, and these are objects that I look at. So then I put in some music here, and there's a whole thing about kind of code and the way music is coded, but then it carries over to feeling, um, you know, and we haven't got time now, but that's an important kind of thinking that I use. But also it's just the pure physicality of, of music that I want to talk about the physicality of form and surface and texture, like in music. Uh, and then the Jackson Pollock um, painting is really just to kind of remind myself to, to talk about the, um, that element of chance, you know, that these paintings at one level, there's so much chance, but there's also control, um, you know, and I think within what I do, there's that same sort of dialogue going on. Um, so this is just to illustrate some work before I started working digitally. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I say, I've been potting for well, since 1980-odd, so however many that years that is. Um, and I have made domestic wear pots as a livelihood. Uh, and then I've always been, as I say, more interested in producing these sculptural pots. So you can see, uh, you know, top left here was a residency I did in a doctor's surgery. So there it is about using the vessel form, the pot form, as an analogy for us to understand our own well-being, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this year was a... Um, uh, residency on a pathway and I installed pots along the pathway. A lot of these pieces, these pieces are, are thrown on the pottery wheel and cut up and recomposed. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas other pieces, these bigger pieces here are actually coil built. So technically, I think that, you know, the importance of this idea of coil building, you can see, you know, this is a meter high piece is I absolutely understand clay really well and how to build in coils and build in layers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sort of for the last 12 years or so, I've been, you know, using 3D printing and working with computers for the last 20 odd years. Um, and uh, as I've said, I've kind of really, you know, my interest is in form and how we respond to form. And then I'm kind of interested in how we draw, we can draw form with code. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I work in code. Uh, Jonathan, but how, how you made this shift? How did you start to, to work with the printer? Yeah, it was um, actually in 1999, I was uh, uh, along with 10 other artists, visual artists, sculptors, painters, you know, printmakers, we were commissioned to produce a CD-ROM. So this was, you know, sort of the, uh, and by the library service. The libraries thought, well, okay, people are going to come and they're going to look at this little, you know, memory disk sitting on a laptop <laughs> or on a, you know, on a screen. Um, now, what would happen if artists get given this opportunity? So, you know, sort of, I was, I wanted to get into this area. I got the commission and then just, so I was given 3D modeling programs and I just, you know, sort of being interested in form, the realization what you could do in a 3D modeling program was just fantastic. You mm. see, you know, up until then, all my forms, I'm a process-based person, was, you know, kind of thrown forms cut up because I don't like the restriction of just the continuous, you know, sort of sym symmetry of the, po the pottery wheel. I'm much more interested in coil-built forms. But then coil-building is so slow, um, you know, mm -hmm. and you can get much more imaginative forms with coil-building. But here I was managing to draw in the 3D modeling programs and thought, wow, you know, this is what, you know, kind of the, the shapes, the pots I want to be making. 
So to begin with, you know, I was using the 3D modeling programs as a kind of a memory aid to sketch with. And then I'd go back into the studio and throw and cut up and make those pieces as in the previous slide. Um, but then it got to a point where I just thought, I, I need to get these files out of my laptop into physical objects. Uh, and it was, you know, 2007-ish. And it was just when sort of 3D printing was really breaking through into sort of fab labs um, yeah. and, and, you know, sort of becoming more, not at that stage, not DIY, but, you know, sort of more understandable, I suppose. And it was more on the internet. Um, and so it was actually, you know, say 2010 that I started printing and I copied the Unfold Studio. You know, mm -hmm. they sort of first did it and I went and visited them. So it's Dries Sinclair who's in your exhibition as well. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, we've worked together since then. But after a couple of years, the machine that Unfold used and I started with, I found restrictive and I wanted to develop a new machine. So I actually developed this machine here. You know, that they, by then, 2013, sort of fab labs were getting very popular. There was enough information online to be able to build your own machine. So I built this machine that is kind of open source on the internet. There's videos on, on YouTube and that. And, and this has been built all over the world since then. So kind of I upscaled it. But I have to say now I've befriended uh, Wasp or Wasp and I get together. So Wasp is an Italian company that made 3D printers. Um, and uh, they give me machines to, you know, trial and work with. So, you know, I had the smaller Wasp machine that one can see there. And then, you know, now my favorite machine is actually sitting hanging behind me. Uh, but this, this big Wasp machine here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, although there's all that interested in, you know, drawing, creating, generating the forms digitally, there's still absolutely this studio knowledge, you know, this tacit knowledge of, you know, working with clay for the last 40 years. So when, you know, the machine is basically coil building, I know how you've got to stiffen the clay up mm -hmm. so that it doesn't fall over. You know, I've done a lot of testing of different clays and that's what's going on here. You know, electric firing, ga uh, gas firing, that all comes into it. So, you know, you still have to deal with the surface as well. Um, so this is my workflow a little bit that, as I say, you know, this shape is drawn out in code. Um, whoops, I moved, I moved on a bit quickly there. Um, and the, the coding is, is self-taught and I keep it very simple. This uh, platform I'm using is called something called processing. Um, and anyway, that when I press the little yellow button, I get a visualization of the 3D model. This isn't live, so I can't turn that around. But with a mouse, you can move that in 3D, see how it's doing. I then capture this digital file. And very often I would then edit that further in a modeling program. And I use one called Blender, an open source program. And, and it's this transition from the, the abstract sort of mathematics of it through to the physical object that you can hold, see, turn around, that I think is just, you know, really magic. Um, so here uh, again, this is the one of the last projects, isn't it? Uh, it's it's ongoing. Yeah, mm. I, I tend to work in series, mm -hmm. and the series are often around a piece of code. Um, so this this one here is what I call random cube. In fact, so actually I take a cube, and um, it's a bit like a Rubik cube. It's it's you know cut up into smaller cubes. And I just get the, the computer code to go through and either literally randomly switch on and off the triangles. And so if it's um, you know, very lightly randomized, you get that sort of thing and heavily randomized, it's getting, getting this here. So mm -hmm. I then capture these 3D files and that's my sort of starting point. And I mm -hmm. can then take those, these files, I import them into the Blender software, the drawing software, modeling software probably better known as. Uh, and I then can, you know, draw it further. So you can see how I pulled up the rims. These don't absolutely coincide, you know, these forms, but it's to give you an indication. Um, and uh, so, you know, from this drawing, you can either have a solid surface or a wireframe. So this is the wireframe. The wireframe always just looks really nice. Um, so, you know, those are, that, that's the wireframe that we were looking at just now. So, you know, these are examples of the, um, the random cubes and yeah, I was working in 2020 on those pieces.
Uh, these actually are then similar. These are also random cube, getting a little bit bigger. Uh, this is the room I'm in at the moment. You can see the printer at the back here. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. this series here is something called uh, what I call the knot series. Yes. And that mm -hmm. I have worked with the, you know, the formula or the algorithm for the way knots are drawn. And the whole mathematics of knots is just wonderful. Now, I'm not a great mathematician. You know, the last maths I did was at school, however many <laughs> years ago that was. Um, but it's just the beauty of, of, you know, sort of when mathematicians talk about beauty, I sort of, my ears prick up. You know, well, that's what artists talk about. And I think that crossover is really super. Um, uh, so just some sort of pictures of actually working here. Um, I, you know, I, I inevitably get, you know, sort of asked to talk about 3D printing, and I do 3D printing, but I much prefer to call it computer-guided coil building, because, mm -hmm. you know, as I've explained, mm -hmm. that's the tradition I come from. Now, 3D printing, additive manufacture, is something much more technological in my mind. It's not about making like I make you know, as a potter, that is. And, and so, you know, structures uh, technologically would be supported on the inside and there's stuff like infill and all that sort of stuff. And I just don't get involved in that and support. So you can see as I'm sort of building my pieces, mm -hmm. I've got a bit of hot air on it and yeah. it's drying it. You know, that's the way I'd be working if I was doing hand building, you know. Uh, and then um, if it needs a bit of support, I just grab a bit of clay and stuff it in there. And I don't know how good the screen quality is, but there's a piece of wire lying across here. Mm, I see. You know, as I'm building, I'm lying in pieces of wire that are sort of like an internal scaffolding. Uh, and then once the clay objects are leather hard, you know, they've got stiff enough to hold their own structure, then I just can pull the wires out. Well, soon, uh, soon we'll speak about the work that you, you sent us for the ceramics, but... Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll say it, it was one of those notes <laughs> in my Levakov that I was really struggling <laughs> printing it. He, he did uh, this little paper, uh, little paper cut that he put uh, in between the, 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 the different uh, layers yeah, uh, yeah, to yeah. support it. And it, it was really a, a big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I saw some images online. Um, yeah. And, and I, I tried to choose an easier one. I didn't send, yeah. a, difficult, I didn't send a difficult file. <laughs> okay. uh, but just some other work. And then the, my last slide is the current project. So, the, you know, that <laughs> will lead on nicely. But uh, during the worst of lockdown, I was working on these pieces that are, are, are called mandel, mandel bulbs. So I call, you know, well, I call them funerary urns for 2000, 2021, obviously, you know, the height of, of the pandemic. Um, but I was using this Mandelbolt uh, 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 or Mandelbulb um, algorithm and uh, it, it creates, you know, it's a fractal pattern and mm -hmm. the, it has an R number in it. So, you know, I don't know what your news was like, but here on the BBC, you know, in the worst of the pandemic, we were being told what the R number was. And that was by how fast the, um, the um, uh, infection was increasing, you know. Mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's, it's fractal, yeah. you know, like this pattern. So I was making these objects that were in some ways a visualization of what was going on, that I could turn up the number, and there's a whole series of these, and the higher the R number, you know, the more infected these areas yeah. become. Yeah. Um, an older piece, I mean, now nearly uh, 10 years ago, seedbed. Again, this is all generated just without one piece of code. Uh, and this that is um, uh, spherical harmonics that, you know, the, the algorithm is spherical harmonics. Uh, it's got about um, eight uh, parameters to it. And the more you turn up the par parameters, the more effect you get, but mm -hmm. in different dimensions. So you can see, you know, I'm getting a change sort of evolving across here, and then I'm getting a change evolving in this direction. And then inevitably on the diagonal, you're getting the combination of those two. Um, so, you know, I guess it's a bit of a theme the whole time here is simplicity and complexity, that I try and work in a very simple way, but the results can become very, very complex. 
um, some pieces that you all know. We were both in this yeah. exhibition together. But yes. um, I, I, you know, my exhibit, I had three sort of areas of work in it. So there was actually the, the drawings, the ant drawings that are digitally generated drawings that can either be printed out on paper or played as an animation on screen. Um, and then uh, the Langton ants, that's a whole other story, but Mr. Langton is a game theorist and I got into some of his sort of formula. Uh, and then these more sort of anthill pieces where the coloration here is just the raw clay. These are unglazed, mm -hmm. these are glazed mm -hmm. porcelain, unglazed. And, um, you know, as a lot of people do, we put in different colors of clay and as it comes through the machine, you get this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the kind of the way that ants will go and just pick up the material and use the material. Uh, harmonic vases. So in actual fact, this is the similar sort of algorithm as with that seabed. But here I've just done it on a, sim, uh, on a cylinder. Uh, and the resonances, you know, happen here uh, with, you know, sort of other sculptors and particularly African sculpture, I think is really kind of interesting. But, you know, now is not the time to get into it. You know, I always say these are very Brancusi-esque, you know, and Brancusi was really interested in folk traditions and folk traditions are about kind of just working intuitively. And what is your intuition? Your intuition is those qualities that are, have evolved, you know, out of the natural systems in you. So I think, you know, the computer code is getting back and, and mixing in with those. Uh, so the knot series, we've spoken about those, just some smaller pieces here. Um, and these are wonderful to watch in the generation, you know, because the, the, the sort of on screen, it sort of slowly grows and goes around in these knot patterns. I, I then recompose it quite a lot in, in the modeling program. So in actual fact, this one here is one knot that I've then mirrored and brought back together. Mm. So mm. I'm playing with the symmetries. Yeah. Um, another knot series piece, you know, that is, this is uh, the piece that you have in the exhibition is out of the knot series. Uh, rooted series, uh, so this is just coming through at the moment. So these are growing much more like roots do. It's about fractal mm -hmm. patterns you know, sort of branching and growing. Uh, and then the twin piece that's in your exhibition, Nature and Nurture. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about this, this piece, but, but before that, uh, maybe we talk a little about uh, open code or about this all kind of transformation of, of information, because I think that uh, from, from those participants in the exhibition, you and maybe Studio Unfold are most, familiar with open code way of thinking and as a, as a philosophy, as a, as a community, what you can say about it? Uh, I mean, oh, oh for, yeah. with, uh, just I'll, I'll expand my question just yeah. for a little, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, for some artists that I wrote this email of uh, inviting to the exhibition, it was kind of a surprise and some even they said, no, I would not share my files, etc. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but I think that for you, it was kind of obvious because you already experienced all this kind of project. So can you elaborate a little about it? Yeah, yeah. No, in an early, uh, I can't remember the date, but probably it could be, you know, eight years ago. So exhibition in Copenhagen, I, mm -hmm. I printed out some of the code and put it on the wall of the exhibition you know, to actually kind of express that th this is how the pieces are drawn. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, you can copy it, but for me, it's like publishing. You know, if someone writes a story, you can't, you know, what's the point in copying that story? You know, I've, drew, I've drawn a line in the sand and I've said, this is my original artwork. Here it is. You know, you, you, can, you can imitate it if you want, but, you know, it's sort of, this is my artwork. Um, and uh, so, you know, in answer a little bit to that sort of whole open code and hope, uh, open source ethos, uh, you know, I guess it is just my sort of politics and my ethos is I, um, you know, that 3D printer that I built, I built on all sorts of other people's knowledge and I used mm -hmm. open source code to run it and everything. I just managed to put it together. So surely the, the obvious, you know, for me, in my thinking anyway, I just pass it on to the next person and then they will build on top of that and build on, you know, mm -hmm. that's how knowledge is, that's how libraries work. This is part of the, the discussion because 
For yeah. example, one artist say about me who owns the rights of the work you will print. And for me, it was sure that the artist owns the right. It doesn't matter who prints it. And, uh, 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 but then he refused to, to participate in, in this project. Uh, so le let's uh, speak about your, your work because I think this is one of the good examples of uh, taking this idea of, of uh, code uh, mm -hmm. and to take the, the file and uh, to, make, to, to uh, encounter with the uh, metaphor of DNA or genetic information and to uh, do kind of experiment of printing in two different parts of the world and see the outcome as part of, of what will, of the result. So mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us about it from your uh, yeah. point of view? I, I had been involved in a similar exhibition once before where you know, the, um, the organizers said, would we send the files, get printed? That, you know, is a wonderful idea. It means the work doesn't have to move, you know, as you, mm -hmm. you know, you lay out in your introductions. Um, and I have to say for that exhibition, I copped out a little bit. I sent a teapot because I just sort of thought this is an idea, you know, and it, it was what I'd been working on at the time, the idea of that uh, as a designer, you could design this teapot that is an open source teapot design. And then anybody could print it in clay and please print it and let's use teapots to make tea with and not use, you know, um, tea bags because I don't <laughs> like tea bags. Um, so, that, you know, needs to say it had a bit of kind of political edge to it. Um, and uh, so the idea was there that the, the, um, the, the model, and, and I think we need to possibly separate out here a little bit, but the STL model for the teapot was open and, and it is on Thingiverse, that is the file sharing platform, so that anybody, you know, could size to whatever size they want the model, and then they could, you know, slice and make some code that would go into their, their printer. Now, um, when you approached me for this, this project, I sort of thought, oh, it's time to be more thoughtful, you know, as, as we did, and, and it's this idea of nature and nurture, obviously, is that going back to, you know, sort of twins, and I, this is kind of an area, not surprising, got really interested in, is identical twins and this idea of identical twins having been separated at, at early development. Um, so their actual kind of objective DNA is the same, but then what influence does the environment have on it? And, you know, surprisingly, what happens often is that the identical twins, they might then grow up, you know, in totally different environments, but somehow they, you know, sort of, it, it's that whole thing about free will, you know, how much free will do we have in our lives, that we are this, you know, sort of our inherent embodied selves that you can't get away from. And so if you have our two identical, you know, bodies, those characteristics are going to be there. So, you know, as in ours, so obviously on the left of my screen anyways, is the image that I call the Suffolk twin. So it was printed here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then you've got the uh, piece in your exhibition that was printed um, uh, out in Tel Aviv. Uh, and the clay would have been different, but uh, I gave you the, well, I, yeah, I gave you the, the glaze. So the glaze is actually the same. So those sort of objective, the, the file is the same, the size is the same, the surface is, as such the same, but the environment is different that each piece is made in. Yeah, but you know, also uh, when you send me the recipe, uh, also we use maybe different, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. different different materials. Our cowling is different, our ball clay is different. So uh, uh, the the shade of the, the glaze uh, feels uh, rel re relative and almost the same, but the shade is different and the mm -hmm. um, uh, and also, I think your experience of printing in comparing to our our producers here in Israel, of course, is is uncomparable. I mean, you have a lot of experience and you know how to print it in one uh, homogenic uh, uh, piece. Um, uh, I think when we got the, the your video, uh, we were like jealous. Maybe we can show the, the video. Oh, yeah.
when you see the outcome, did you, what did you feel? Did you felt disappointing or happy or? Um, what did I feel? Um, I, I think the feeling was one of intrigue because obviously, you know, like I, as I said, my work is very process based. So I always set up this sort of idea, this process, and I let it run and see where it goes. And so that's, you know, a bit from the coding as well mm -hmm. is, you know, very often I push the button and I've no idea what I'm going to get and I'm of, of intrigue. So I, I'm always working with this open mind. And whatever the piece looked like on exhibition with you was what it was going to be, you know. So I, I had absolutely no problem with that. I had open mind. Um, the feeling... I, yeah, it was a bit mixed in that sort of, I thought, ah, now, I guess the point I wanted to try and get across was, you know, I suppose within 3D printing, there's a bit of a kind of a public uh, um, attitude that, oh, it's cheating, possibly mm -hmm. using the machine, you're cheating, um, <laughs> that um, I've heard things, uh, terms like de-skilling being used, you know, where's the skill? Now, for you know how some people work, possibly that is the case. But you know, I always and provocatively say that my work is highly, highly crafted. You know, right yes. from mm -hmm. the clay preparation to this mm -hmm. video. You know, when you, you you can see the video and you can see me interacting with the machine, and, and it's my studio assistant. You know, um, and that's the point I wanted to bring across. And I just thought that mm -hmm. your exhibition expressed that really well. Yeah, I think meeting point between craft and digital world here is very crucial. Uh, and the uh, uh, Noam Dover that he's also exhibiting in this show, and he's my uh, colleague of mine, and he's always said um, ceramic 3D printing is very spoiled. You have to nurture it, you have to be around, you cannot go away and come back. You can't, it's not like a, a, pushing the print button and go away go you have away, to yeah. do a lot of like you uh, uh, did in your in your uh, production like uh, heating the the clay in mm. the right uh, time etc etc so so there is a lot of craft in this kind of printing yeah, yeah. it's not a uh, just a mach mach mechanical process mm. that's for sure you know i don't want i've got absolutely no claims that the way i work is you know the best way it's what suits mm -hmm. me you know there is many yeah. ways of working as there are artists makers whatever we call them and technologists using this technology uh, yeah yeah and we still need to explore it yeah and well, thank you very much, Jonathan. It was very interesting. Thank you.